Hey folks, Luke with Alternate Arm Self-Defense. Now, as you can see by the board before you, today I'm going to be going over some of the fundamental questions that we receive from folks regarding the physics of less than lethal. Now, obviously there are, there's way more to it than this, but these are the top four questions that we receive from folks in regards to this topic. And my goal today is to make this as palatable as possible. We do intend on this being a multi-part series, so if you would like to see more, please comment below. If you have your own questions, please comment below. We'll be able to go over as much as we can. Now, just to jump right into it, what is a joule? Well, if you search up on Google, you'll see that a joule is a unit of energy. You'll see a joule is one half mv squared. You'll see a bunch of stuff, right? And to bring it down to its most basic, basic definition, a joule represents the relationship between the mass of a projectile and the velocity at which it is traveling. And I'm actually going to write down that aforementioned equation just to show you guys. So we have kinetic energy, which is represented by joules, in this case, <laughs> equals one half mass times velocity squared. Now, Obviously, those of you who took physics or calculus, you understand that this is derived pretty easily using fundamental calculus theories, and that's not too difficult, but we're not here to go over that. Um, all this is saying is that a joule represents the relationship between mass and velocity. In this case, it's directly proportional. If you increase the mass, you're going to see a decrease in velocity. If you decrease the mass, you're going to see an increase in velocity. Now, this is in an ideal circumstance. I'm about to show you the exception to that rule. But in an ideal circumstance, as you increase the mass, you will see a decrease in velocity, assuming that that joule count is constant, which since we're talking about less than lethal, in an ideal scenario, the joule count should be constant. We're going to talk about the exception to that rule, and that is joule creep. So, I'm going to draw the cross-section of a barrel, so to say the two-dimensional representation of this barrel, and I'm actually going to draw two of them. So, we have two barrels here. One has a lighter ball, the other has a heavier ball. And every time you fire your less lethal launcher, all you're doing is you're expelling a certain amount of gas out the front of the barrel, which pushes the ball forward, thus giving you a certain joule output, right? In this case, with the lighter ball, whenever that gas gets released, it flies out of that barrel extremely quickly. In the case of the heavier round, it flies out slower. And according to our uh, previous equation, one would deduce that if the joules are constant, you're going to see this travel faster, this travels slower. Well, we're not in ideal circumstances here, are we? The really cool thing is, since this heavier projectile is traveling through that barrel slower, it is under the influence of this pressurized gas for a longer period of time. The actual joule output of the launcher is equivalent to the amount of gas that's released, which is way higher than what your launcher shows as it's shooting because there's a ton of air wastage. Well, in this case, using a heavier projectile decreases that amount of wasted energy. So, by the time it leaves the barrel, it has been under the um, influence of those gases for a longer period of time, thus resulting in a higher joule output. With the lighter projectile, it leaves the barrel so fast, you get a bunch of wasted air, wasted energy, and a lower joule count. That's joule creep. Now, I'm going to skip HPA versus CO2 real quick. I'm going to go on to blow by and what is bore matched. Now, if we were to take these same two barrels, we're going to do this for blow by and bore matched. If we were to take these same two barrels, and in physics, we usually use extremes to explain basic concepts. But we're going to use a round that is almost the exact diameter of the barrel, which is to say it is bore matched to the internal diameter of the barrel. And we're gonna use a round that is quite a bit smaller that is not bore matched to this barrel. Now, same instance here, we're going to fire the launcher 
which expels a ton of air. Now, in the case of your bore matched projectile, there is very little air that is able to pass around this uh, projectile, thus resulting in a much, much higher uh, amount of air that's being used to actually push the projectile forward. Whereas with your smaller round, you get a bunch of air that blows by, which also creates these swirls and these vortexes, which drastically reduces the amount of power the launcher outputs. And similar to our drill creep example up here, if you want to have the maximum output for your launcher, you want to use a round that is both bore matched and heavier. And before you say it, I know what you're going to say. Luke, isn't there a limit to how heavy a round can be? The answer is yes. So just to show you guys in a graph, if we were to do a graph showing the relationship between joules, which is to say the power output, and the mass of the projectile, you're going to notice that with extremely light rounds, you get low power, followed by an increase in power for the increase in round. You get what is called your point of diminishing returns. So you have to have an ex exponentially heavier round in order to get a marginal amount of power increase, followed by a decrease in power. And the reason why, just to use extremes once again, if you have a ball that is the weight of a person, when you shoot that round, when you're rather when you shoot your launcher, the gas expelled is not actually enough to even push the round out. So going away from the extremes, if you have a very, very, very heavy round, when you fire it, that gas actually won't be enough to push it to its maximum power output. So there is this point of diminishing returns and with with some with some um, let's call it with some launchers it's higher than with other launchers because obviously each launcher outputs a different amount of gas so you're not going to be firing an 8.8 .8 gram round out of uh, one of our T4E guns out of the the Glock or the Walther PPQ right whereas with the Pistel you can use 8.8 .8 gram rounds you can use 10, 10 gram rounds um, it's all up to the specific launcher now if you would like to see the difference between a bore matched round and a non bore matched round, you can actually try this at home. I'm going to take this barrel. I'm going to put one end of the barrel on my hand, thus um, preventing any gas escape out of the back. I have two different projectiles here. I have a nylon round, uh, sorry, iron infused nylon round, which is 0.685 bore, and I have an aluminum round, which is 0.684 bore. And that is to say that there is a difference of 0 0.001 inches in their diameter. You can't even tell, obviously. But try this at home, or you're going to have to trust me. When I put the um, iron-infused nylon round down, it travels down the barrel very slow. So as to say there is very little air escaping out of the sides. Whereas when I take this 0.684 bore aluminum round, it travels significantly faster and I mean like significantly faster so you'd think that it wouldn't make a difference but it absolutely does and uh, that's just something you could try at home if you got a pistol from us you got a bunch of different ammo so you can actually test them out and see which ones are bore matched and which ones aren't now jumping back one going to HPA versus CO2 and talking about phase changes um, the main difference between HPA and CO2 HPA is just it's simply high pressure atmosphere air so 78% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, a little bit of everything else, right? Whereas CO2 is in its liquid form, carbon dioxide. And we have what is called a phase change. And I'm going to explain to you what this means because this actually is why CO2 is greatly affected by a temperature change and HPA isn't. Well, CO2, I wish I had a cartridge on me, sorry. CO2 is stored in a liquid state. So to say that 12 grams CO2, all that's saying is there is 12 grams of liquid CO2 within this little capsule. And when you fire your launcher, that liquid CO2 undergoes what's called vaporization. So to say it goes from a liquid to a gas and is able to fire out. When you have extremely low temperatures, the amount of time it takes for that liquid to vaporize is longer, thus resulting in a lower pressure. In ideal circumstances, so 75 degrees Fahrenheit, if I recall correctly, CO2 usually vaporizes out at 850 PSI. Well, <laughs> when it's colder out, that can decrease drastically. When it's hotter out, that can increase drastically. So if you're in a hotter climate, um, 
for example, just to use another extreme, if you leave your CO2 launcher in your car and it exceeds 150 degrees or whatever it is, there's a chance it can explode and that's because all of that liquid CO2 in there is so hot that it's, ex it's trying to expand against that shell of the CO2 chamber and uh, you know, eventually it could blow up. Now, obviously high pressure air being just compressed high pressure air is also affected by temperature but not nearly in the same way and that is because high pressure air uses what is called a primary regulator to regulate down 3,000, 4,500 psi down to 6, 7, 8, 9,000, 1,100 psi. So if you look at an HPA tank, that top piece, the piece you actually um, refill through is that primary regulator. So obviously it's not going to be affected by temperature nearly as much because it's being regulated down by that regulator. Now, um, I think that's going to be it for today. Um, I'm not a great teacher, so I apologize if this was a little hard to understand. I stumbled over myself a few times, but we do plan on doing this more. So if you guys would like to see more, if you have any particular questions that you'd like to see answered, please comment down and I would love to get into it with you guys. So thank you so much. Bye-bye.